Herzlich willkommen zum zweiten Teil unserer Online-Konferenz. Welcome to the second part of our Online-Conference Pandemic and Global Democracy and a panel on uh, the abuse of the pandemic as an instrument of repression. Thank you very much for taking the time. My name is Florian Ruber. I'm the head of the office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation Columbia. And I would like to thank my colleagues from Berlin, in particular Laila and uh, others for the opportunity to conduct the panel together with our three guests, two of them from Latin America. Where and how was the pandemic used as a tool of repression throughout the pandemic? And what does this mean in concrete terms? How or which patterns have emerged and what mechanisms have been employed? And what does it mean for the civil society, for journalists or opposition groups? What counter strategies have they developed and what do they expect from us? We would like to discuss this now in the next 90 minutes together with our guests. The discussion will be conducted in three languages, German, English, Spanish. This means that you can select the respective language at the bottom of your Zoom window. And together with my colleague Luisa, we are happy to take your questions in the Q&A tool, which we will later on ask our guests. But first of all, I would like to welcome our guests very cordially, Carlos Dada, from the website or from the paper um, El Faro. He's the founder of El Faro, the biggest um, web-based newspaper in, in Latin America. It, It is the beacon for qualitatively high level journalism in Latin America, and it is known for its investigations into corruption cases. Carlos has reported from different conflict regions, um, and in the year 2011, he received the Maria Muscat Award, the oldest journalist prize for excellent reporting on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much, Carlos, for being here. And we also have Diana Salinas um, from Question Publica. She is a journalist and also co-founder of Question Publica, which is a digital medium focused on investigative journalism and she also focuses on the reporting on corruption and the relations between politics and the uh, economy. She's also won the Simon Bolivar uh, Award uh, several times. And I would also like to welcome Bausch Samadov. He is an anti-war activist. And at the moment, he is a PhD candidate at the Charles University in Prague. He is an author of critical opinion pieces about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and the power abuses in Azerbaijan. And he focuses on, in his research, on authoritarian uh, rule and the depoliticization processes in Azerbaijan, in society. And he also focuses on mobilization and movements and post-political order in a non-democratic context. Thank you very much to the three of you for taking the time to be here. I would like to start the discussion with a question to our three guests. Diana. Diana, thank you so much for being with us. Um, let's talk just a little bit about the pandemic, como an instrument of repression. Colombia and uh, the Latin American continent are characterized by a high degree of social inequality and social conflict. Um, what uh, political effects has the pandemic in Colombia and uh, the region had on human rights? And has the pandemic been used as an instrument of repression, according to you? And if so, to what extent? And then how has uh, the Colombian state reacted to the pandemic and expressions of social discontent? Thank you so much, Florian, for having me. There are different elements of repression that have been used and uh, that have been used in two major moments of political protests. Uh, one was in September 2020, 
with the political force that was employed in the middle of the pandemic uh, has uh, caused the death of one of uh, the civilians and the massacre of uh, 13 civilians. And then we had a second uprising in the um, uh, April of last year to 28th of April of last year. And uh, this is due to um, the fact that uh, the uh, governance uh, was handled uh, according to presidential decrees. And then of course, with and without uh, the argument of the pandemic of uh, COVID. So uh, there were many different reasons. Uh, so there were really more than a hundred political presidential decrees where we really saw a governance that was do uh, done without uh, the legitimization of the parliament and without justice. So we had a whole effect uh, of uh, yeah, the whole effect of the executive powers uh, that uh, is implemented um, 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 led to a national strike, uh, and uh, they had a very warlike uh, reaction from the Colombian st uh, state, because uh, this political protest uh, was uh, um, interpreted with a coalition of the dissidents of uh, the FARC movement. Uh, and as you all know, we have been included in the peace talks three, four years ago, and those have been the collateral effects on the political sphere. Thank you so much, Diana, for your first insight in uh, the uh, situation in the country. And then I would like to continue with Carlos. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Welcome here. The new president uh, in uh, El Salvador, um, Bukele, has been criticized for the political use of the pandemic between illegality and human rights violations. Um, and then I would like to ask you as well. So what have been the political effects that the pandemic has had on human rights in El Salvador and the region? And uh, do you think that uh, the pandemic has been used as an instrument of repression? So how did the state react to that? Thank you so much for your question and uh, good afternoon here from the other side of uh, the Atlantic in Central America, as well as in the whole world, the panic has been used by the government in order to push forward uh, populism and uh, uh, corruption. After three decades of uh, democracy in our region, we see once again that power is imposed, uh, monologues are used, um, and uh, the uh, organized crime and corruption has seen a major rise and uh, we see uh, a weakening of our democratic structures and uh, the uh, um, utilization of the state apparatus uh, in order um, to well, um, do away with our rights of uh, free expression, free media, and therefore we have a public debate uh, that is uh, really limited. So I think uh, the fourth countries um, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In my country, um, Bukele has um, done away with all the uh, democratic institutions with a very um, Im impressive speed. And uh, they have uh, threatened with the dissolution of our parliament uh, and um, espionage. And uh, this only after one year in the presidency and the mandate. Uh, and it's really in interesting to note that uh, it is the most popular um, president uh, in Central America and uh, his role or his position did not diminish at all after all these scandals have risen and this is really important to note because uh, there has been a lot of public debate about and about democracy and El Salvador was uh, one of those countries that imposed the strictest uh, measures uh, that helped uh, Bukela to uh, exercise his power, the territorial um, control and uh, what we talked about, a push of uh, populist uh, movements and um, then uh, the delivery of um, uh, food uh, packages to the most vulnerable population groups. Uh, and uh, we have been seeing a lot of presidential decrees uh, that have been uh, drafted and uh, then with the pandemic as a pretext, uh, the administration of Bukele uh, uh, started uh, uh, the persecution of its political opponents um, 
we had military patrols in order to avoid that uh, that people could leave their houses. He doubled uh, the volume of uh, the uh, um, armed forces, and uh, what for me is uh, the strongest sign that uh, they uh, have under or, or marked their own political uh, objectives with the help of the government. So um, I think we've seen harassments, we've seen um, persecution of the political opponents and uh, uh, the uh, doubling of uh, the armed forces um, and uh, the forces of the police, uh, of uh, the prosecutor's office, and he is concentrating all the forces against uh, the institutions and organizations. They still try to resist, they try to push forward for uh, open um, or the um, free expression of opinion. And then uh, the journalism, on the other hand, that uh, is still not corrupt. Uh, Thank you so much, Carlos, for your uh, first reflections on the situation in your country. And I would like to switch to English and give a warm welcome also to Varush. Uh, thank you for having you. And I would like to uh, give you the same uh, question as I gave to our colleagues. Um, Varush, uh, from your point of view, what political effects did the pandemic have in Azerbaijan and the wider region? Um, has the pandemic been used as an instrument of repression and how? Thank you, Florian, and hello, everyone. Hello from Prague. And uh, yes, it's, uh, thank you for this important conference and questions. Uh, I joined my colleagues and um, it's it's been similar in Azerbaijan too. And first of all, I would like to mention that uh, in Azerbaijan, it is the same uh, party is in power from uh, 1993. And the country first uh, first 10 years was kind of semi-authoritarian and uh, after Ilham Aliyev came to power, he took the cabinet after his father, um, it's turned to full-blown authoritarian regime and what we have been witnessing uh, last decades is growing homogenization of power and uh, growing authoritarian repressive methods against uh, the so-called like uh, opponents or enemies of the state, of course they can be different. And uh, during the pandemic, I would say that first I would like to start with the fact that before the pandemic, there were uh, numerous challenging events in the country. First was snap elections in February, and even before in October 19, there was a huge protest rally in Azerbaijan. These things are like uh, not something usual in such a uh, stable authoritarian country. And with the, the outbreak of pandemic in March, uh, to 2020, it was something that, uh, <laughs> of course, unexpected for the government. And in March, uh, Ilham Aliyev, the president, he made a speech, a uh, notorious speech, and he compared opposition to the uh, to uh, virus. It's this kind of notorious Nazi-like metaphor that has been. Uh, it's it's a very like Nazi metaphor because Nazis used to used this metaphor to compare uh, Jews to uh, virus to micro microbes. This, uh, in a similar way, Ilham Aliyev president used this kind of, like, yes, we have virus, but the real virus is the opposition. And this uh, pandemic, he, he says that it's, it means that uh, we need a new crackdown on the opposition, basically. So basically, uh, this uh, special quarantine regime has been declared. And many oppositional uh, activists, be they like prominent figures, leaders, or just uh, normal, uh, just usual like opposition activists, they were arrested with, they were detained. And uh, the new thing here is that they used this new legal uh, administrative arrest. And, they, and the argument was that they broke this uh, quarantine regime, why they are not at home, why they break the, <laughs> the quarantine rules. And, uh, it's, it was like something like they used as an argument, a legal argument to detain these activists for uh, 50, sometimes to 15 days, sometimes to 30 days of administrative arrest, just to make, just to uh, weaken the opposition and to prevent uh, any other uh, ways to organize further rallies or something else. O of course, it was at the beginning, but then the war happened between Azerbaijan and Armenia, the second war in Nagorno-Karabakh, 
and uh, it's it's completely changed the reality. And of course, here too, the pandemic uh, situation, not in the country, not just in Azerbaijan, but in the world, has been used for uh, in terms of when the war started in such a, a turmoil, in such a chaotic period in the world. Of course, it was uh, much easier to start the war and to uh to be in the war and not to attract uh international communities uh attraction let's say uh, thank you barus for your for your first comments um i would like to talk with you a, a little about a little bit about the role of, of of opposition and civil society you mentioned that um i want to ask you how has the political opposition adapted to this situation of the pandemic and the repression and which ro role have played, for example, civil society groups or the media or the youth? Uh, yes, thank you for your question, Florian. Here, it's important to mention that uh, the leader of one of the leaders of opposition, Ali Karimli, his internet connection was blocked. And he didn't, if, like, when you come to his uh, apartment, there is no internet connection. And it is very important because in, uh, in an authoritarian environment in Azerbaijan, oppositional leaders, they don't have any access to local TV channels, radio stations, or the only way to communicate with their audience is internet and internet media. And uh, it was a first case when a certain uh, person doesn't have an access to internet just because uh, they cut the internet using special uh, tools. Uh, mechanisms to block this internet connection in this area when he lives, when he in his, his apartment, and of course it was a blockage of internet for him, and it was the main voice of this protesting opposition, and uh, basically for the in Azerbaijan opposition oppositional parties there's they are divided and uh, before the war after the war is in wars. And I can't say that they they really adapted to this, uh, they used to adapt to this uh, pandemic situation or now they are better. I can't say it because uh, it was also unexpected for them too. So they basically uh, some, somehow, they, now of course the situation is better because the Oplatian regime is more consolidated, it's powerful. But when it, the, the, at the beginning of the pandemic, it, the regime was really, uh, I wouldn't say weak, but they were kind of shocked. They were, uh, they didn't expect that some something like this will happen. And uh, but now they are they are, they feel fine with it because after the war, uh, they feel that they um, somehow proved their legitimacy one more time. And uh, they have nothing to to, to be afraid of. They don't have any uh, any real threat yeah, in the country. But at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, it was a different situation and. Uh, I, I would say opposition now is even, uh, how to say, it's even, even more weak than at the beginning because after they didn't know how to react to war. Most of them supported the war as a national, national, nation level issue, as a, something that okay, our people, it's it's a people's war, and in, in this sense of argumentation. And now they are kind of in a situation of crisis. They don't have anything to offer. The same as the civil society. And I would say that nowadays in Azerbaijan, the regime, even if the regime is really uh, um, as powerful as it's never been before, at the same time, uh, the opposition doesn't have any, don't have anything to offer to the people. And at the same time, uh, I would say the overall, uh, how to say, vibe in the country is kind of pessimistic, because after the war, the, situ the overall situation uh, hasn't changed. Uh, war veterans or families of those uh, who, who those who lost their uh, relatives in the war, their economic situation, social uh, situation is worse. And the same situation uh, is, uh, is, I would say that with all middle class families or working class families, peasant families, of course, they feel even more insecure than before the war. But at the same time, the, before, because the opposition has nothing to offer, the situation is in this kind of, I would say that in, I would depict it in a dark tones. Thank you very much, Barus. And I, 
quisiera como volver a conversar con Diana y Carlos. I would like to come back to Diana and Carlos. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, the pandemic, the social protests and uh, the repression that we have witnessed. Uh, Diana, you mentioned the social protests in Colombia last year that uh, was uh, obviously seen in the whole world in the news. And I would like to ask you the following. Do you, how has the pandemic impacted the mobilization, but uh, first and foremost in the, the women's mobilization, uh, for example, in the context of social protests? Uh, and then I would like to ask uh, what uh, role did uh, the young generation play? Because the protest uh, that we've seen in the context, uh, well, usually, surely, I mean, as well included the young generation. I would like to uh, get in dialogue with the colleagues uh, and say that this social protest was not a, a, a usual social protest. Uh, I think it was uh, the biggest uh, social upheaval in the, from the last 20 years in Colombia. We had really many, many deaths uh, from young people, more than 80 young girls and um, boys um, died because of the protest they participated in and um, the inter-American uh, Commission for Human Rights uh, really called upon the media and uh, in order to regulate the situation because the polit uh, the repression of the police uh, from the Ministry of Defense was really was really without precedence. And um, I think uh, since the 70s, did we not see anything like that after um, the government? Uh, well, uh, um, well, Dubai. And for the first time in those uh, protests, uh, let's uh, refer now to the women. You were referring to the mobilization of women. I think uh, w women, uh, for the first time, we had the impression that they had a common voice because there was really a huge uh, movement, uh, the collectives, the collectives of uh, women, groups of women, uh, human rights activists, and um, there really was a series of uh, cultural expressions uh, that made uh, what could be made heard because of the protests. And now, if uh, you would walk down the 7th Avenue, which is uh, the most important avenue that connects south and north of uh, Bogota, then uh, wherever you would see um, the expressions of uh, um, like the bad situation. And part of that was done by the mobilized women. And then we had the opportunity, uh, Question Publica, this is uh, the um, um, organization I'm working for. Then we had the possibility to work together with the inter-American community and uh, we provided a report. And uh, we had the impression that it was really important for them to let them know uh, from us uh, that uh, how many sexual abuse cases uh, had been presented uh, throughout the protests. And uh, we did not only see uh, cases of abuse against women and young people, but against uh, journalists. Uh, and um, we're not only referring to uh, the sexual abuse, uh, it was really difficult uh, to cover the events because it was like in a warlike situation. We really had to, to wear um, special equipment because uh, um, it seemed to have, um, in, in order to shoot the police, they did not have not any problem to shoot at uh, the uh, people taking part in the protests. And um, it led to one case of suicide of a young girl who was abused sexually. And then uh, the government, of course, they tried to cover it up, uh, to work with false news, and uh, this then ended up in the Congress. So this uh, is more or less the atmosphere we're talking about. And when it comes uh, to the, the women's mobilizations, and then you asked for the young generation, I think the repression was so strong that in two months, or in the first five days of the protest, or the, the worst days, then uh, we had about a thousand detentions, uh, a thousand arrests, um, so because they simply took to the streets, which is a riot in Colombia. So we had um, those thousand arrests, and then um, throughout those two months that followed, uh, we had more than two thousand arrests that followed up. So this was a political decision because uh, it uh, really turned everything into a political aspect, and. Um, 
So uh, it, it, it's still difficult to talk about it. It's a primera linea, the first line. This is a young generation that tried to face the police and uh, the repression imposed by the police. And uh, this uh, debate uh, was treated by the government if, as if they were terrorists um, and therefore they did have the right to shoot. So, uh, and, and they, they really ignored the fact that they might kill those people. And um, what's important to mention in this context is uh, that uh, we have a huge paramilitary movement, um, you might know about that, where the um, civilians uh, take to the arms in order to take on the role of the police. And uh, here we had a, a new outlet of uh, this uh, of this violence that uh, the civilians uh, aren't them and uh, work together with the police in order to shoot at those people taking to the streets. So this uh, was uh, the role of women, of young uh, people. They started to do street blocks uh, in uh, um, different quarters in Cali and in Bogota. This uh, did not happen before. And uh, the governance of those cities uh, really uh, stayed on the hands of those young people who blocked the streets uh, with uh, stones and bricks. And uh, they tried to not let anybody through. So this was a very complicated moment. <laughs> Sorry, I have to interrupt because uh, uh, we would like to give Carlos a voice. I would like to ask you if um, these kinds of protests uh, could be witnessed in El Salvador as well. And how did uh, the um, the state surveillance increase in El Salvador during this uh, phase? And the uh, espionage uh, or the case of espionage uh, against El Faro, then we were talking about the spyware Pegasus could you just fill us in briefly how you have uh, used or how you have witnessed uh, this way of repression against the social protests? Um, today, it's just, yeah, it's of the day, it's a month ago, where we published, published uh, the investigation, where we really looked into the interception of uh, the uh, um, mobile phones of all the members of El Faro. 34 people are working in El Faro and 22 of our mobile phones of um, the employees of El Faro um, were intruded with the spyware Pegasus. Um, and how did we how did we observe it? So we sent all the data and the mobile phones to two specialist companies and um, Sirius Lab in Toronto and Canada looked into it. And um, they explained uh, what they found in our mobile phones. And uh, I quote, it is like obsessive espionage, not only because of the number of people uh, with uh, an intrusion in uh, their mobile phones, I was referring to 22, but as well um, because of the level of intervention. And so just briefly, I would like to say that um, every operation that is done by Pegasus. They can download all the information that is included and stored on the mobile phone, audios, uh, videos, uh, emails, uh, applications, passwords, everything can be downloaded and accessed to. And in real time, they can activate the microphone and the camera of the mobile phone in order to monitor what you are doing. So the period from the first uh, intervention until the most recent one, uh, here we're talking about a time frame of uh, one and a half years in order to give you an idea. And only in my mobile phone, they have been connected um, for more than 160 days uh, in this time frame of one and a half years. And I'm not the one that is most monitored from all the employees of El Faro. Carlos Martinez, uh, he... Uh, uh, has uh, looked into um, the uh, relationship between the government and the criminal groups, and he has been basically permanently supervised. 198 days uh, where operations could be followed on in his mobile phone. So everything was uh, was monitored um, via the camera and the microphone. So everything that is not including only the professional life, but as well the private life. This is not the first case of espionage or harassment of uh, um, well, us as uh, 
representatives of uh, free journalism. They have sent drones to our homes, and uh, this is something that really affects you when you see that uh, a drone really enters into your house and uh, then stops in front of you when uh, you are working. This is really frightening. But um, the whole state apparatus is uh, uh, really trying to uh, persecute of uh, political opposition or uh, the activists. Um, and uh, we have seven open investigations uh, and um, the president of the republic uh, expressed in a, a state of uh, the union uh, accused us of uh, well, money laundering and um, this is more or less the objective of uh, the uh, uh, follow-up they tried uh, with all the available means uh, to uh, silence us um, and um, they have, uh, yeah, they have been using our civilians with all the necessary means uh, to try to paralyze uh, the international community here. Today in El Salvador, we have uh, a massive uh, uh, silencing of uh, the civil population. And for the first time in 30 years, we have uh, political exiles and uh, not only um, people that flee the country because of economic reasons. Now we have political refugees that have to leave the country. We have uh, political detainees, um, uh, the people that have tried to protect our right to free access to water. And um, effectively, we did have social protests, not as massive as uh, we might have witnessed in Colombia and that, uh, of course, we have all seen in the media and uh, on our screens. But uh, the political opponents or the critics uh, are still in the minority because, as I said, uh, the president is still quite popular, but we did see massive protests um, in the three or four movements, uh, we have seen a blockage of the police that have to try to shut down the whole city that uh, uh, where we didn't, they did not want to have more influx of protestants uh, to the movements. And um, the police and the armed forces are fully controlling those uh, protests. And there is a clear message of uh, the government. So everybody who is trying to oppose his uh, regime will see the consequences. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, and I would like to go back to Barus. Um, Barus, we heard a little bit from Diana and from Carlos, the forms of social control, um, governmental surveillance, forms of uh, repressions uh, which are occurring in, in Latin America, in South America, in Central America. So I would like to ask you also in your region, what would you say, which would be the general or also specific patterns which have emerged and what me mechanisms have been employed to per perpetrate uh, perpetuate restrictive measures, limit the free press, adopt digital surveillance politics, and in general terms, exercise control over protests in your in your region. What's your mm -hmm. impression or your balance? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Florian. As I mentioned, the internet cut was something new. It was a new mechanism of control uh, of, let's say, protesting voice, because the voice in Azerbaijan, the opposition, overall, I would say the parties are always have always been, uh, it's, of course, it's not something good, but they were always leader centric. And when a certain leader um, doesn't have access to internet, doesn't have any way to, to call for protest, of course, it means collapse. And of course, this is a problem of the opposition uh, that they, uh, in like 30 years, they still could, can't build any, uh, they, did, they, they didn't succeed to create ideological opposition, but rather it is like a leader center position and uh, parties. So yeah, this method was quite, how to say, um, um, how to say, it it, it it worked. So they just blocked his voice, and it means that there is no chance to social to create social mobilization and to mobilize uh, uh, dissatisfied uh, segments of society against the regime. And it was at the beginning of war. 
But uh, dur uh, during the war, it was even much worse. But I wouldn't connect it to pandemic directly. I would rather connect it to the situation of war because uh, it was just uh, like uh, no internet connection and they cut internet connection almost uh, for, for a week and people just uh, were forced to use VPN and uh just to be connected and to the internet and to know what's going on in the country but it's it didn't last long it it, it lasted for uh, for more than a week and during the war and the war was 44 days war it's called and after that uh yeah people had this internet connection but it didn't help to the opposition because uh, after the war it means if the if uh, one side wins the war, of course, for the population, it means that yes, it, this uh, especially in authoritarian countries, uh, uh, victory means a method to uh, of relegitimization, and uh, I and here I would also like to add about the pandemic a little bit. I wouldn't say that Azerbaijan really the, the pandemic really affected Azerbaijan in a way that like hundreds of uh, thousands of deaths and this way because of uh, uh, the vaccination process was somehow like uh, almost like forced vaccination and uh, plus or minus but <laughs> it's kind of helped to uh, uh, to be not not to lost uh, too many people and uh, to be like in a safe site during the pandemic and uh, and now this the problem there is no problem with vaccination and also I wouldn't say that after like this March April at the beginning of pandemic uh, and after the war I couldn't I, I can't say that there were some uh, really harsh lockdowns or nothing like this and uh, but at the same time this the very fact that the war so started uh, in the middle of the pandemic uh, means that the regime utilized the pandemic situation in the region, in the in the world, to wage a war, and especially after the victory, of course, it doesn't have any inner threats, and uh, it just it, the regime feels uh, stronger than before the pandemic. Yeah, uh, Barus, maybe I I would like to ask you uh, something else in this context. So. From what you're saying, what would be the lessons learned from the use of, of state repression? And what would you say do we have to pay attention to in the future? Uh, what might be strategies against repressive and authoritarian patterns and measures um, which we yeah, would have to support? Um, what, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, of course, it all depends on the context because in a context, uh, authoritarian countries are really different. So they can be tyranny, like in Belarus, when the regime, uh, like, de depends fully on like force. But they can be situation like Azerbaijan, when the regime, of course, uses violence, but in a very practical way. It's not a like mass violence against like huge segments of society or just like this kind of mass repressions. No, it is rather a, a very practical repression, repressive tactics against certain uh, active uh, members of opposition or party leaders. Let's say uh, so. In Azerbaijan, the this practice of repressions are very practical and a very uh, how to say. They just isolate certain members of society just to prevent this, uh, let's say, uh, calls for protests or practices of mobilization. So I would say that the yeah, authoritarian contexts are different, but in a situation of pandemic, and I would say that in Azerbaijan, the opposition almost like fully failed during the pandemic, before the pandemic, during the war, before after the war. <laughs> generally, they didn't they have any proposition uh against this kind of uh neither against the pandemic measures uh, nor against the war and uh what can in uh i would say that in a way the only real opposition during the war was this uh youth movement that we created against the war it was yes we were really marginalized but we were really at the same time our marginalization didn't mean that we were kind of invisible no, at no, uh, vice versa, we were really visible during the war. Our voice against the war, against this and against militarization, 
and uh, for peaceful resolution of conflict. Of course, it's not about pandemic, I know, but at the same time, this was a way how to raise your voice in a situation of when you are uh, in alt not just authoritarian, it was not just, a, I would say that it was not just an authoritarian situation. It was a situation of totalitarianism when the whole society is mobilized in the name of uh, patriotism, in the name of uh, victory, war, and so we were just a marginalized minority, but at the same time we were visible. And uh, the situation is that after the war, and uh, it was proven that the only real opposition were just this, uh, just this minority of uh, youngsters with progressive views uh, who stood against the war, who stood against these measures. Uh, of course, we also even despite these differences with of with this mainstream opposition even if even taken into consideration the fact that, that they so also supported the war even uh but ethically we also condemned any repressive measures against them and uh we, even there was a small rally of progressive youngsters against this this uh measure so against this oppositional members against the mainstream opposition after the war and yes, I would say that um, the main thing here, not to be afraid to speak up, in, in a, even if this whole society is against you. Uh, because now, we say, uh, if, even back to the, the war, we were really marginalized. Now I see uh, the complete opposite. And uh, our voices are even like many people who opposed our views during the war, they agree with us, the opposition members, uh, sometimes silently, sometimes explicitly, they see that actually, yes, we supported the war, but it was a mistake. It's, uh, it was a huge mistake for the civil society, either not to speak up or to even to support the war. They see how the regime is even more consolidated, even more powerful now. And of course, they agree with us that, yes, the war was a disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to come back to Carlos and Diana, and I would like to ask you a bit about uh, the uh, um, lesson, about uh, the lessons learned. And uh, then, first of all, I would like to ask you something maybe a bit more specific for the Latin American context. Uh, so, what was the role of uh, the organized crime? in the case of uh, El Salvador, uh, the uh, role of the Maras, and in Colombia, the armed groups. Uh, so how did they contribute to this atmosphere of repression and uh, the lack of uh, free expression? Diana, how, how do you see the, um, the, the, the panorama of uh, organized crime and criminal groups? In Colombia, of course, uh, the guerrilla is uh, still in power, the ELN, and um, they have uh, territorial power, um, first and foremost in the Pacific region. And this leads to the fact that uh, during the pandemic, uh, when the quarantines that have been imposed, uh, they had their, their, their own frontiers, their own borders for the free um, movement of people. And uh, then after those moments, uh, the um, guerrilla Right now, we are in different. So we are seeing quite a few of uh, attacks, uh, terrorist attacks in Colombia, and we did not see too many victims, so fortunately. But um, there is uh, an, an activation uh, from those groups. Um, and then, of course, uh, we are in the pre-election phase, and those groups have uh, a way of um, trying to nurture or to make use of this pre-election phase uh, to uh, receive more attention. So they, of course, contribute to the repression of uh, the uh, civil society and uh, the drug, drug traffickers, of course, uh, play an important role. The um, um, most powerful clan is playing its role. And then between the guerrilla, the drug trafficking and the dissidents of FARC, uh, we have a cocktail in Colombia that uh, where we find uh, in different massacres that are taking place and uh, 
than uh, we've already seen more than 100 massacres during this administration, many social leaders who have been killed, which is part of the repression. And I wanted to share with you just briefly, when we talk about the digital sphere, uh, something that here we call, are calling pat pat patrolling. So we had uh, different um, agreements with uh, software companies and um, those softwares had the possibility to screen the social media and to, to uh, make a surveillance of uh, those people who had, that try to, to politically express themselves in opposition to the government. And therefore, we had really a strong attack against the free journalism, free journalists and uh, the question publica. My organization has been censored in twice already via Facebook, uh, where we tried to open up the public debate um, against uh, abuse of power by the police. And this uh, did not only happen to question publica, this happened to many other different websites. And I think this is important to mention. And then finally, um, we uh, witnessed uh, repression against uh, the media outlets uh, because uh, we had limited access to information information. Earlier, we had the possibility to access information within 15 um, days, and now it's two months. So um, after the, um, the, the worst part, uh, it seems we still not have free access to information. And then we had a repression in the sphere of uh, the uh, vaccines. Um, so uh, they tried to uh, to take more time for uh, the more vulnerable groups to have access to the vaccines. They seem to take longer and negotiate the right conditions in order to um, provide access to, 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 to those vaccines. Thank you so much, Diana. Carlos, I would like to ask you more or less the same. So what's the situation in Salvador? where we have seen a country that was uh, uh, quite in the grips of uh, the gangs, of the street gangs of the Mara. So what was their role in the last month or years of the pandemic? So um, we discovered the role of those gangs in the beginning of the pandemic when the government imposed one of the strongest and the strictest uh, quarantines uh, in a um, uh, center of detention where uh, the the people did not have the possibility to get back to the countries and they have to um, pass like maybe a month in those detention centers people became ill some of them even died and in El Salvador we have many different communities uh, communities that are controlled by the gangs where the state really does not have any hand in it. And um, those gangs really uh, exercised their power. They uh, controlled everything, the access to those communities, and they were really instrumental in the imposing of the strict uh, quarantine. And um, they controlled people who were in the street. They took uh, care of the distribution of uh, the food packages to the most vulnerable groups that were um, put at the disposal by the government. This was the first time that we really observed uh, this important role of the gangs, uh, at least in their different uh, uh, regional uh, communities. Then, at least during this very strict con um, lockdown. And then in September in 2020, we published that we had evidence uh, that the government uh, had been negotiating for one year already with the gangs. And uh, we found proof of uh, um, um, Mara Santa Trucha, MS-13, that uh, they had had uh, negotiations with that. And uh, um, uh, Sureños is another group uh, and um, we try to give an alternative solution to um, the uh, quite successful um, reduction of uh, homicides and um, the um, safety plan that has not been presented in the public. And uh, then we found uh, evidence and proof of the prosecutor's office uh, that uh, spoke of uh, um, uh, registers of uh, the prisons where um, 
officials entered and left detention centers or prisons and uh, gangs that entered and left uh, the prison, um, all the work that had been done by the pro um, prosecutor's office. And therefore, it uh, we really have proof that there had been ongoing negotiations between the government and the street gangs and um, that... Uh, and we know that uh, the gangs really have been an important element of the control of the quarantine that was imposed during the pandemic. And uh, Florian, I think uh, you have uh, asked about the lessons learned. And that is a very personal reflection in the case of El Salvador. What I was really impressed by or what I mainly learned is uh, that I uh, was really, um, I was misled about uh, the strength of our, um, the power of our institutions with uh, Bukele, or the, the political system was uh, um, almost uh, equally distribu distributed between the left and the right, those who um, signed uh, the peace agreements in 92. And I think since then, we have uh, been quite successful in establishing a democratic system, a mature and uh, healthy system. And I would like to repeat that we are a more stable country as compared to the other Central American countries. And now I see the speed with which uh, the, um, this uh, new regime is uh, yeah, destroying this uh, newly elected system and the balance between two powers in our political system. And uh, I thought it is institutional stability, but um, this is not the case. The institutions did not have any resistance uh, when it came to the destruction of the regime. It changed the constitution. They um, established a re-election and uh, it was um, basically um, a, yeah, they, they, they took over the power and uh, they have silenced uh, the opposition, they have uh, limited the access to public information, we really do not have any independence of our different powers, and uh, the armed forces uh, once again have this political role that they had before the peace agreement, so this is really an important attack on our democratic system, and a last reflection before I finish, um, uh, we hope that everything finishes and therefore the pandemic will finish and uh, our system will finish as well. And we try to um, well rebuild our democracy and um, don't um, be misled by the uh, balance of powers, uh, which is not the case in our country. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your input. I would like to remind the audience that um, you can ask your questions in the chat. And actually, Luisa, I don't know, um, maybe you may want to contribute your question. Yeah, I talk in English because I've got an English question. And um, it's from what we heard until now, political repression and pandemic coincided in time but repression processes started prior to the pandemic and probably will go on once it's overcome. Are there any structural links between harassing democracy and pandemic, the pandemic being a cause for the former? That's the first question I got. I know, Barus, if you want to yeah. mention something additionally on this issue, and then maybe I, I could give also the, the word to Diana and to Carlos. Yes, uh, uh, I, I would like to add some answer to this question. Uh, basically, yes, I agree with uh, the questions that actually, yes, the, in uh, these kind of authoritarian countries, repressions, uh, at least in Azerbaijan, I would say that there's a good word to describe it's sedimented, it's normalized, especially after 2013 when uh, after first waves of repressions and uh, yeah, it was a shock first for, I was like 18 uh, years old when my friends were arrested in 2013, but uh, year by year, this, the whole country has become normalized and so, for example, when someone is arrested for uh, for one month or 
even uh, criminal even with criminal case, uh, it's charge of drugs or something. It's it's in Azerbaijan all these things are normalized, and uh, I can say that pandemic uh, something like uh, game changer here. The only thing that pandemic changed, at least at the beginning, was the fact that they created this kind of a special quarantine regime in order to prevent any kind of protest. Because the, this uh, 2020 was a, at the beginning of year was a lot of people were dis dissatisfied with elections. There were a big rally before the elections, and uh, the only thing that how it was used is the creation of special quarantine regime. And it was uh, it created a legal reason to re reason of uh, to arrest uh, uh, opposition members for violation of quarantine regime and to uh, for it was a reason for administrative arrest of dozens of activists. And yes, I, uh, this was a it was one thing. But at the at this uh, at the same moment, I I agree that. It is impossible to say that uh, pandemic, uh, the outbreak of pandemic, like changed the changed the whole situation. And now before it was like less authoritarian. Now it's more authoritarian. Now these regimes they always use same uh, surveillance methods, same uh, methods of repressions or suppression of any kind of protest. So uh, it only like it's it's only that strengthened their uh, methods, at least at the beginning of pandemic, when the situation was, uh, there's not clear what, what's gonna, going to going, what we don't have in two, three months. Yes, at the beginning, it was like this. But yeah, it, it's not a game changer, at least in Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you, Barros. Um, y yo quisiera también preguntar a Carlos y a Diana. Eh, I would de... like to ask Carlos and Diana, from your learnings, what could be those reforms to put in place in order to find a solution? We have a question here from our colleague Ingrid Ver, the director of the office in Central America. Ingrid is asking if you can explain how the latest reforms of the legal code have led to legalization of those programs of um, uh, uh, surveillance and how do, how do those reforms affect the uh, independence of the press or, or the legal institutions? I would also like to say that in Colombia we have elections to the parliament and also to the presidency. So I would like to ask Diana, how do you see, how do you expect the future in Colombia regarding this conflicted um, these conflict subjects. But Carlos, perhaps you want to share your reflections upon the matter. What would be those reforms and changes in need? Maybe I start with a question uh, asked by Ingrid, and I would like to use the opportunity to uh, say hi. Well, after our publishing, when we revealed the espionage taking place uh, via the spyware Pegasus, we weren't, we're not the only ones affected, but uh, first and foremost, El Faro. And uh, what we've seen from the government was just silence. The only response that we received was uh, a message uh, from uh, the government uh, that was given to Reuters, where they said that uh, the government, of course, was not the responsible agent of uh, the spionage, that they were themselves victims of spionage and um, that uh, they were asking for a proper investigation. So this is an argumentation that uh, obviously uh, does not really make any sense, because if uh, they think that, um, oh, they're so powerful, when they can even spy on our dissidents, then of course they should be interested in uh, uh, possible attacks on against our national security. And just a uh, brief detail, Ingrid, uh, when we, they were looking into our mobile phone, Sirius Lab uh, discovered, or they could see 
live when they were retracting information from our mobile phones, uh, they, uh, without any doubt, uh, could see that uh, those extractions uh, were done from the territory of uh, Salvador. And uh, this is something where I would like to link over to another question. NSO Group, which is the producer of uh, this software, and they have been confirming that uh, this software is only sold to state-owned institutions and authorities. And um, that uh, their customers are usually confirmed or uh, assessed by the Israeli government before they deliver the software. So, and after this silence uh, that we received from the government three weeks after um, the assembly that is controlled by Bukele, um, they um, drafted the uh, the law Pegasus, and uh, they were saying that they did not assume any responsibility, and uh, that uh, that is a, a I cover it up agent and uh, this allowed them without any controls uh, to uh, um, to, to, to intercept our um, telephones and not only against critics or um, political opposition or the as well against uh, the small political opposition that exists in my pay, uh, in my country and uh, this is why I would like to underline that the Israeli government does have some responsibility. If they don't monitor the use of their software, then maybe they're just uh, very lax. Uh, um, then um, it's not really coherent with the history of Israel, or it is a state that uses uh, the sale of this software in order to draw some benefits, politically speaking, because uh, then usually um, well, the use against activists or journalists is absolutely prohibited. And what we've seen is an extensive use of the software in authoritarian regimes against political activists, against dissidents and against critical voices. Uh, and therefore Israel has part of uh, the, or is part of the problem because they are selling the software. A few weeks ago, we have seen the publishing of the investigation, how um, Israel is benefiting politically from the sales of this software to authoritarian regimes like ours in El Salvador. And uh, now after, the discovery of uh, the use of uh, the software against journalists and activists right now, it is an instrument. So it is a legal instrument, but uh, sorry for taking so long for this response. I don't know if you want me to uh, react on the other one as well or for waiting for other people. Yeah, please share your wisdom with us. So what would, uh, according to you, would be necessary reforms? And the same is uh, what I would like to know from Diana, what would be necessary reforms in Colombia? And then afterwards, we have another interesting question from the public. Oh, just briefly, necessary reforms. Well, um, well, of course, uh, we, what would have to be changed in our um, in our laws or in our institutions right now, this would not make any sense because this is not a problem of uh, of uh, the legal system. It, it, the problem is that we don't have any rule of law, that we don't have any constitutional guarantees. If um, um, if uh, they wanted to expose uh, the highest constitutional court and um, something that was imposed by them, that uh, they, they did not uh, comply with any of the in institutional constitutional requirements, uh, then um, they, um, So uh, they, they try to, to um, do away with a third of uh, the um, of uh, the judges, then uh, we, we, we do not see any um, judicial independence. Uh, and right now in the Salvador, we, it doesn't make any sense to um, establish reforms. I think we have to respect our laws and uh, our rules, um, but uh, uh, there is no resistance in the institutions, in the regime right now that is uh, presided by Nayib Bukele. Um, it, it, it does not have any consequences if he um, um, does not comply with the constitution. The constitution is only there to justify his deeds. And uh, whenever it's convenient, he's doing whatever he wants. No consequences whatsoever, no legal, no penal consequences. This is the situation we find ourselves in right now. Uh, thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, Diana, over to you. So what would be uh, the necessary strategies or reforms in Colombia in order to uh, to wait um, the um, 
repressive actions from the Colombian government. Uh, we've talked a lot about the police reform in Colombia, that the police is not uh, under the uh, Ministry of Defense, but maybe another ministry. So what can we expect from the upcoming elections in May? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think uh, maybe the only necessary reform is the reform of the police, uh, because uh, right now they are within the Ministry of Defense. And as we all know, they, uh, they, well, they, 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 the principal role is to protect uh, the civil society. And right now we have seen um, police abuse uh, against uh, the national order, and therefore, um, uh, Elis Mack is uh, a, uh, a, a, um, a, um, a movement against um, anti-disturbios and against uh, the social upheavals. Um, so this could be a reform that uh, this uh, um, police corps uh, has to undergo this reform. And then um, maybe um, it is, right now convenient to, to work on the reforms right now under this regime that has some tendencies uh, towards uh, uh, authoritarian an authoritarian regime and in the elections uh, i think uh, we have a momentum of uh, polarity where this country has been marked by Alvaro Uribe, by the policy of Alvaro Uribe and uh, the tendencies of uh, the um, in the election. So we, we still have a big portion of people uh, following on what he is doing. So this is uh, of uh, the extreme right wing. Uh, and then the other candidate uh, that uh, we have right now is uh, from the left wing movement. And uh, he, of course, uh, um, mirrors everything that is done by other left wing regimes like Venezuela and so on. And in that sense, I think the society um, right now, generally speaking, is uh, waiting for, may it be a left or right wing, that uh, they respect our constitution, that they respect the democracy. And uh, first and foremost, they respect uh, our human rights. Uh, people are really fed up with a government that is working like it is right now, generally speaking. And um, then we have uh, um, the, uh, we have problems with the connection. And um, so there is a lot of uh, tension. I would not really dare to talk about the future because it really depends on the future administration. If we have a government that is based on the, poli uh, the policies from Alvaro Uribe, then uh, we might have uh, more repression. And if we have a government from the left wing, then uh, it would create a lot of tension because what happens with certain economic sectors? So this is uh, more or less uh, the outlook. And uh, when it comes to lessons learned, if you may allow, I think that uh, is something quite similar to what's been said by Carlos is happening. And I have would never have thought that the democracy would be so fragile in Colombia. And then, um, however, we did have a conflict, but we just uh, signed the peace treaty. And uh, uh, we, we thought that uh, the uh, um, government would uh, support the peace agreement. This is something that did not happen. And this fragility, this vulnerability, for me as a journalist uh, of a, of a, um, a part of the civil society, something I have never seen before. And um, when we have an apparently democratic uh, structure with the three powers, but uh, if we don't have a counterweight of the executive, uh, then of course I'm talking about uh, the prosecutor's office and uh, all those uh, instances that cannot guarantee justice because uh, the prosecutor is uh, in the hands of the president and the same applies to all the other institutions. And um, so we are talking about people that uh, have uh, been 
um, employed by the Ministry of uh, Finance or of Justice. So we really have a very fragile situation right now in Colombia. And the lesson learned would be that uh, whatever government uh, would uh, win left, right, up or down, in uh, we have to take care more of our democratic structures because uh, this is the only thing that uh, maintained the power of Colombia and uh, the power of the civil society that has been working in different instances, um, that we still had a certain democratic structure in Colombia throughout this time. Thank you so much, Diana, for your input. One last question to our guests, but before that, I would like to give the floor to Luisa because there is uh, another question from the audience, I guess. Yeah, I've got one more question right now. Um, maybe Barus wants to answer that. It's um, this pandemic will have would have been a golden opportunity to reinforce authoritarianism, including informal democracies. Can we assume that many regimes are looking forward to the next pandemic? Uh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, it is really hard to predict what's going, what will happen next. But um, yes, there there are a lot of questions about it, and uh, we we know that even in some democratic democracies, like let's say fri fragile democracies, fragile democracies, or uh, not fully established democracies, uh, of course, this kind of pandemic measures they can be used for uh for better surveillance or to strengthen the uh, incumbent parties of course all these things may happen but uh i am here i would be like considering what we have now i would be a little bit skeptical about the fact that the, uh, this kind of either authoritarian regimes or uh semi-authoritarian regimes hybrid regimes they're gonna use pandemic measures they already have enough instruments for surveillance for, for example pegasus has been mentioned today uh they already have their own mechanisms of uh strategies or repressions either mass repressions like in belarus russia or practical repressions like in azerbaijan or like in the situation in Kazakhstan, we seen how, uh, let's say, this kind of regional corporation was deployed to uh, to crash this uh, people's revolt or, or, or let's say outbreak of, uh, of mass anger. So I would say that these regimes already have uh, international or, or let's say regional corporation. They have or they already have enough mechanisms, tools. To suppress uh, um, to suppress protest or uh, revolt, rebellion or whatever. So I can't say that here the pandemic, uh, any other pandemic, can be used for uh, another wave of like let's say um, George Orwellian like uh, dystopian uh, repressed repressive uh, mm -hmm. tools. But anyway, yes, uh, I understand these concerns. Uh, at the same time here, it's, it's important. I also would like to mention that state is more visible than ever uh, before pandemic. And uh, some people would say that it's actually good because uh, we have state again and state should serve people and state should pr uh, provide people with uh, free vaccination. The state should uh, improve the free medical uh insurance or medical facilities just uh and now we have state so but others even like some philosophers like georgia agamben or some right-wing libertarians they would say that no it's a dystopian measure or we have st we, uh the invention of uh, the intervention of state to private life of course this kind of philosophical debates they are inevitable but at the same time yes i am still skeptical about uh, the facts that, about the ideas that pandemic will lead to a uh, new dystopian world. Thank you, Byrus. And uh, I, I would like to uh, make a last question to all of you. Um, um, I would like to ask you, and uh, starting with, with Byrus, so what do you consider should be the role of international community? And in particular, of what would be what should be the role of Germany or the German government 
regarding political measures to strengthen democracy in times of the pandemic in Azerbaijan or in your region. What advice would you give um, to the new German government? Uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Yes, uh, it's very important because in, uh, well, in Azerbaijan, I would say that any kind of, uh, for civil society, for progress, either progressive, let's say like, let's say young, uh, super progressive oppositional uh, guys, uh, young people from one side, from the other side, mainstream opposition, let's say traditional opposition or whatever. In, in any case, for, uh, for both, any support from European Union, particularly from Germany, it is it has a, uh, at least moral impact. And when you see uh, when uh, embassies in Azerbaijan of uh, Western countries, they uh, either they release statements or they um, meet with members of opposition. Uh, of course, both have impact on this um, at least a mental health of activists. Uh, this thing, so this context, this context should uh, uh, should be should be uh, even more usual than before, uh, even more uh, often than before, and this is very important. And from it's one thing, and the other thing is, of course, uh, we have the authoritarian government, and this is the fact that we have it. And uh, European Union has close economic ties with, uh, even, uh, especially after the new gas agreement with Azerbaijan, of course, these economic uh, ties are even more visible. Uh, considering all these things, I would say that if European Union and particularly Germany, uh, with all these gas agreements, economic ties, if they will at least push the Azerbaijani government to release political prisoners or uh, not to, let's say, not to touch the progressive part of the opposition, I know that these things are, are happening. And uh, Azerbaijani government, it, it, despite all this authoritarian side, it still kind of respects this kind of uh, personal or let's say uh, indoor uh, calls for uh, or pushes not to uh, not to be as not to be as repressive as it was six seven years ago. So all these calls they still work, and I. My suggestion, suggestion for the new government would be to push the government to the authoritarian regime uh, to be <laughs> at least less repressive. I would like to ask you, Carlos, what do you consider is the role of the international um, society, uh, specifically? in Germany and concerning the, the situation in Salvador and Central America. Yes, um, the governments in, in Europe are not only government, but also millions of citizens and, um, and civil society associations. And this is, I'm not very good to give any recommendation or suggestions to any government, but government sometimes are very slow in their movement. They are weak because uh, they fear to break any uh, relationship or to create any distances when uh, journalists and citizens are exposed to this kind of situations. We need agility. We need to be more agile and a strong position in the international field. Uh, concerning Europe, the, the um, um, constitution of the European Union obliges their uh, governments to defend human rights and democracy. So uh, European governments seem to have forgotten all of these bases. So they have prioritized all the kinds of interest, uh, mainly economic and geopolitical. So they have forgotten their main fundamental principles in their constitution. So we, from El Salvador, we see Nicaragua, and we can see how Nicaragua, during uh, Daniel Ortega dictatorship, they have attempted against their own citizens. 
and this was intensified since 2018 when they repressed protests asking for democracy and respect for human rights. We've also seen that uh, to the extent of uh, putting in jail their political rivals. So they have carried out a, an election without any rivals and they have uh, um, they have been regarded in, with a, in an inefficient way by the international community. So from Salvador, we see exactly that. We see how Daniel Ortega was able to do all of that and even to use paramilitary forces to kill their own citizens. They have, and this has had no consequences. The international community uh, has been ineffective in defending human beings oppressed by a dictatorship. So um, my country is seeing how Nicaragua is um, eliminating democracy, attempting against their own citizens, and this has no consequences, no real consequences, because the priority is today for Europeans who seem to be uh, go, European governments seem to be uh, big companies, big corporations, rather than keeping their uh, basic principles from their constitution. Thank you, Carlos. I would finally give the word to Diana and ask you, what would you say to the international community and specifically to the role of Germany? Well, Colombia has uh, signed uh, the peace agreement, uh, but it's still a very fragile country for the lives of many. And uh, during the elections, uh, uh, we hope uh, that uh, with the independent press coverage, uh, we will have uh, the power to inform the public on time in order to announce uh, what is uh, coming up. Uh, because uh, when uh, the press uh, is uh, by the uh, official uh, mechanisms, then we need to strengthen the ties uh, for uh, free expression of opinion. And then we try to uh, work with the support uh, of the international community, the spaces that are put at our availability to, to meet, uh, to come together, to exchange idea, and the digital format, uh, how we are doing it today, in order to be able to talk about these issues, these uh, issues that are so important to us, in order to have an open discussion where uh, we will have the uh, possibility to, to, to contribute and um, to, to let the world know what is happening. And uh, we are in the middle, of course, and uh, we still have open wounds that have to be closed down. The conflict is very, very, well, or the peace is very, very fragile, and uh, the conflict's not over, and therefore we need the support, we need uh, the exchange, the international dialogue, and I think this is the best we can do. Thank you very much, Diana, Carlos, and Barros. We have talked about the pandemic and repressions and lessons learned for uh, the past 90 minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would also like to point to our next panels tomorrow. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock German time, we will talk about new barriers inhibit civil society action and participation. And in the afternoon at 4 p.m. German time we will talk about how to reclaim democracy new opportunities for civil society mobilization so thank you very much for now for your interest thank you very much carlos diana and Baruch. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who has um joined us here and uh, please uh, let's meet again tomorrow.